I'm back at you with the video, the recap video that I was promising uh, regarding the Better BF and Bivol fight. Got a little wrapped up with uh, my own health and um, as well as um, those that don't know, I'm working on my PhD in cell biology. So I've been getting wrapped up with that the past two weeks. So this got put on the back burner a little bit, but you know, I'm, I'm back at it. So uh, before I go on, go ahead and, and subscribe. So, you know, every time I'm dropping, cause I'm going to get a little more active, um, a, as time will allow. And I'll really talk about some of the, this fight as well as the fights that are coming up, uh, the Tim Zoo fight. I'm going to get into that in another video, as well as the Fundora and Earl Spence fight. So let's go ahead and get into this fight. And it, it played out pretty much the way I said it was, uh, going to play it out. If you look at my prediction video, as well as the um, the post I put in the community tab, I pretty much talk about um, what was going to happen. You have two highly skilled chess players. People think of Better BF as some brute that doesn't really have any thought process behind what he's doing. And the Andrew thought it's just, you know, walking forward like a wrecking ball. He can do that as an element of his game, but he's really... A, he, he thinks first before he he throws punches. He he really is a, a high level chess player that breaks you down mentally far before he breaks you down physically, even though it may not seem that way. And B-Ball, he, he's a master of creating distance and removing distance. And that's what makes him so phenomenal. And that's why I really like this matchup. And then on top of it, they have history. They they grew up and and came up in the same circle. Like they they attended the same academy and Bivol, I wouldn't say he was the little brother, but he was the younger student in that academy looking at Better Bia being the older, uh, more accomplished student in the academy and eventually wanting to get to where he was at. So they they were kind of, I guess, neck and neck coming up through the amateurs as well as, you know, there were high level Olympic fighters. We knew the fights with Usyk and and um, better BF. And then Bivol, he had a very, very accomplished amateur career. And now it seemed like they were on a collision course this this whole time, uh, especially in the past five to 10 years. And, you know, thank goodness that uh, um, the powers that be over in Saudi Arabia were able to make the fight happen. Otherwise, without the money, this wouldn't have taken place. And it's changing the, the landscape of boxing. And, and this fight played out the way I thought it would. I, I picked Better BF to win by decision. And when I repeated myself in my video, I said by stoppage, but that was a typo. I, I meant by a decision because I, I just thought Dimitri Bivol was too good of a fighter, too skilled of a fighter, and too good of a gas tank to be able to gas out and get caught with some of the shots later on that some of Better BF's other opponents got caught with, uh, most notably uh, Alexander Vostik. Uh, go back and look at the Alexander Vostik fight. And that was one of the fights that I used as a template, as a template to see how I thought this fight would play out. Because Vostik at the time, flat out one of the, if not the best guy at 175. People, if you go back in the, the pages of time, people will, will remember uh, Sergey Kovalev as the boogeyman at 175. But the guys that people didn't really Keep an eye on where Dimitri Bivol, Arthur Better BF, Shabransky, he didn't pan out the way we thought he would. Um, but he he never really had a technical skill. He was just strong, kind of like a um a swift. Um, he fought at 154. I can't remember his first name. Jared Swift. Like big and strong, but not necessarily the most skilled to be able to compete with the guys at the top. But those guys, they were up and coming. So it was really no surprise. And Bostic was another one of those guys. All the Eastern Bloc fighters, if you, if you pay attention across the landscape of boxing, it's not American fighters, it's not even the British fighters, it's the Eastern Bloc fighters that are really wrecking shop, even more so than the Hispanic fighters, you know, the Puerto Ricans and the Mexicans and um, some of the other countries in South America, you know, you go down the list. Um, but it's really the Eastern Bloc countries that are lighting things up right now. Um, Vasil Lomachenko. I mean, imagine what would have happened if he didn't have to go over to fight in Ukraine and he got a chance to fight for Undisputed versus Cambosis instead of Devin Haney. Look at Alexander Usyk with all he's done coming up from cruiserweight up to heavyweight. And then look at Vazdik and then you look at Bivol and Better Biev. They have been the epitome of consistency and success and they were undefeated going into this clash. 
So the things that I pointed out going into this fight after that long spiel, because I wanted to set this up for you guys. Um, the two things, the one thing I mentioned for both sides was establishing the jab. And each guy, um, I thought, would need to do it in a, in a different way. Uh, Bivol using the pendulum step. And um, I, I'm going to actually show you guys real quick. You won't be able to see me fully, but, you know, you're bouncing in and out, hands moving forward. Right? And one thing that Dimitri Bivol likes to do, steps in, boom, jab. And then as you step back, Follow with that lead check hook. And then from there, you can read, engage what your opponent's going to do. You might come in, boom, and if you don't bite with that, then I'm might come back in, right? And you're you're moving in and out. And if you have really good gauge of timing and distance, you're going to be very, very hard to deal with. And if you have great feet, that's why people couldn't understand why Canelo has such a tough time with B-ball or why people just didn't even they disregarded b-ball coming into that fight but I, I i followed b-ball on some of these guys before and i knew exactly what was coming and if you look at my video i said these exact same things and then for better b better b -Ev, it's not necessarily just throwing the jab because he has power and pop in his hands it's about throwing that jab and catching b-ball in between punches and so you you have b-ball throwing a jab right and better be -Ev stalking him just like this, with with some of the somewhat of a high guard, and once he has the timing down, especially if he's throwing a couple shots to the body and gets B ball to slow down, um, I'm going to put up some some clips right over here on this side, showing you uh, at certain points in the fight where Better BF was able to catch B ball as he was trying to land his own jab. So B ball went to start the jab, Better BF timed it and. As Dimitri Bivol was landing his jab, a jab was coming right back in. And um, one thing that Bivol does not do well, if, if I can pick anything out, is he does not have great head movement. Uh, he doesn't have, he doesn't use his head movement enough. I'll put it like that. When he does move off center line, he he he's pretty, pretty sharp with it. But a lot of these Soviet fighters, um, they don't necessarily have a lot of head movement. When you think of guys that are Soviet block fighters with a lot of head movement, you think of Usyk and Lomachenko. Trouble G, he had a different style. He had more of a Mexican style. He didn't really use pendulum step, but he moved his head off the center line and kept this triangle, like this cage right here. So it, very, very tough to get clean shots in through the gloves right here, especially if you're moving your head and whatnot. With B-ball, this is pendulum. Wow, 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 right? Wow, move off. But he a lot of times he'll he'll get the tendency to wow, throw straight in, not moving the head off the center line. Head stays still. And that's where better be have caught him a few times. And um, I'm actually gonna go to my notes right now. Cause I wrote down a round where he he caught him um coming in and 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 it it registered it registered it, and it certainly uh turned uh the round a round for uh for uh better bf okay so th those to me that was the story of the fight early on um bivol he he won um the first three rounds and then in the the middle uh four, four five six seven there was one or two swing rounds in there and that's where Better BF started to put step on the gas. Round eight and nine, I thought B-Ball really was able to respond at a point where it looked like Better BF was starting to put it on him. And then rounds 10, 11, and 12, Better BF, I had Better BF down five to four going into the 10th round. And I thought that if B-Ball won at least one of those rounds, the worst case scenario for him, in my opinion, would have been a draw. And if he won two out of those last three rounds, I thought that he would win for sure. That's the way I saw the fight. I thought he lost all three of those final rounds. I thought he he struggled in those final three rounds. Um, after having a, a brilliant knife round, it just seemed like better be able to turn it up. I don't know what you guys thought, but that was my take. And here are some of my notes. So round one, B-ball clearly. Round two, B-ball clearly. Round three, swing round, but I gave it the B-ball. 
Um, I thought he did the better work. Round four, very close round, but I gave it to Better Bia because I thought that he had the the more effective shots. Like Dimitri Bivol, he had clean shots um, at various points throughout the night, but he was not affecting Better Bia as much as Better Bia was affecting him when he was landing uh, clean shots. Fifth round, this is where Dimitri Bivol got hurt by the jab for the first time that I noticed. Sixth round, uh, Better Biev, he controlled that round. I say he controlled the round despite great work by Bivol in the middle of the round. Um, Better Biev was a little bit tired. He was laboring a little bit. And I it might have been the first time where his corner was like, oh, you know, you're not tired. You're not tired. You know, trying to, you know, get him, get him to wake up. And that was an interesting moment in the fight. And then round seven, this was the one that was, this was the round that was the turning point in the fight, in my opinion. Because at this point, I had it tied up three to three. I could even see it four to two for Dimitri Bivol at that point, if you wanted to give a swing round to, to uh, Bivol. But this round, Dimitri Bivol, he was dominating. I had him just just by arbitrary punch stats on my own accord, uh, 20, 20 to seven in terms of punches landed in that round. I thought he was dominating. He was lighting B, uh, better be up, up. And this was the round... Um, where if you go ahead and look at Teddy Atlas's Atlas's um reaction video uh after the fight, he talked about one exchange where Bivol stayed in one punch too long. He landed five punches. He landed uh a combination before that and visibly I, I think buzzed um better be of not badly, but enough to the point where he got his attention and he started stepping back and he stepped back with a purpose. And Bivol, he came, he followed him, he landed one, two, three, four, five. And as he was about to go for the six, I, I don't know if his corner or people watching the TV or even him, but uh, noticed, but Better Bia was not as hurt as the announcers were making it out to be. And in my opinion, they were very biased, the, the, the announcers for the zone. And he caught B-Ball coming in and it visibly shook B-Ball and B-Ball had to retreat for the rest of the round. And from that point on, it seemed like um, B-Ball may have been in trouble a little bit. It, he poured it on for that last minute and he went from being, uh, B-Ball went from being up 20 to seven to being down 28 to 21 because he just started getting peppered with punches. And we didn't know what was going to go on in the eighth inning. Uh, eight minute, eight round going forward, but eighth round, Bivol competitive, but he bounced back. But there was uh, a jab exchange at the beginning of, of that round, and this is what I was talking about with B, uh, better be of catching Bivol in between punches. So that sixth round, even though um, better be of won the, won that round and he was tired, and it was a highly competitive round. Um, at the beginning of that sixth round, he landed a jab. At the same time as B-Ball did, and it was clear that he won the exchange. And it happened again in round eight, even though B-Ball won that exchange. And to me, those little things stand out. And and go back to the timestamp that I mentioned. I might put it up here again. You could just see the heavy-handedness and how he didn't have to be as wary about what was coming back at him, better be of, as opposed to the other way around. Ninth round, Bivol came out and just, he was boxing this man head off. I was highly impressed. It was Bivol's best round of the night, in my opinion. Uh, the foot movement and the counter punching, he was just lighting him up. And I think at this point, um, I that's why I had Bivol up 5-4 uh, after, at the, after that round. And I, I don't know if it was that round in the corner where Better BF's corner was like, yo, you, you need a knockout. Like, you need to get on the gas. And he went out there in round 10, and it started out neck and neck. It looked like B-Ball was picking off, picking up where he left off in the ninth round and going to, you know, win a, a good competitive round. But then better be a – he had a moment in the middle of the round. I, I mean, excuse me. B-Ball had a moment in the middle of the round, but then better be a responded back, and he took that round. I, I think that he stole that round. And others – may agree or disagree, but many have said that have watched this fight that they're like, I don't want to say he stole rounds, but he wanted it more. Um, that's what I saw in that 10th round. I think 
that so that's the one that sticks out to me. If you could have won that tenth and just weathered the storm in rounds eleven to twelve, I don't see where he should have lost his belts. And some could argue he he could have won seven five if he won that tenth round. But rounds eleven and twelve, like better BF clearly won those rounds. Um Round 12, you know, it was back and forth, but, you know, and, and better be if he took over in the middle and, and B-Wall fought back in the last minute. But that 11th round, he was he was on he was on B-Wall's head, man. He was landing big shots. And uh, I, I'm trying to go through my my mental Rolodex of all the, the people that I watched give their opinions of who won the fight and whatnot. But somebody was mentioning that B-Wall... Oh, it might have been Sean Porter on the Sean Porter podcast. Shout out to them. Where they were saying, like, there was a point where it looked like b -ball was debating, like, yo, I got to keep going. I can't, I, can't, I, gotta, I can't quit, right? You can, you can kind of see it in the energy. It was wavering a little bit. But, yo, I'm telling you, man, the mentality that those Eastern Bloc fighters have is something different. It's something different. They, they don't quit. They'll go out on their shield, but they're not going to quit, okay? Um... Shit, I remember the fight with, between Victor Postal and Terrence Crawford back at 135 or 130, whatever weight that was. And Victor Postal was coming off a win over somebody very, very, very good. He got the title because of it. And then he lost to Terrence Crawford, and it wasn't really a close fight. But even though it looked easy, it's, it's because Crawford made it look easy, and stylistically, it was a good matchup. But... That guy was so mentally tough, like he wasn't going to go nowhere. You had to stop this dude. So, you know, listen, Demetri Bivol, he he was really getting railed on in that 11th round. And he's he stuck to what got him here and it carried him through, through to the 12th round. And honestly, even though I thought better be of one, I thought it was a, a good close fight. I thought that the championship rounds were the difference. And I would like to see a rematch because I think that Dimitri B-Ball could beat him, just like I think that better BF could, BF could beat B-Ball. Um, I think that they both executed their respective game plans as well as you could. And it's one of the very, very rare times in boxing where you get two guys matching up with two distinct styles. Um, and they both milk that style for everything it's worth and have a banger of a fight. You don't get that often. Usually you get one guy maybe having some success and, and then maybe a flaw in his style gets exposed in a certain round and boom, it's just all downhill. That did not happen here. So that it was a very, very highly technical, highly skilled fight and I want to see a rematch. Let me know what you guys think, but I, I thought better be of one seven to five. That was my scorecard. But um, I was actually, actually uh, impressed and happy that the knee held up because I was more concerned that we would not get a good fight or the fight that we should have gotten with a fully healthy better Bia. But he looked very good moving. It didn't look compromised. And that's what I said in my video. And other uh, boxing aficionados, they were concerned about the same thing. You know, Sean Porter, Chris Algieri. Um, I think Tim Bradley mentioned the same thing. Um, I know Algieri and, um, and Sean Porter were in the same podcast episode, and they both mentioned it. All right. And if they weren't, they mentioned it at some point. So it's, it's good that that held up. And um, I'll be curious to see if and when they run it back, because Bivo already said he wants an, an immediate rematch. He, he wants to smoke again. And he felt his power. But I think after facing him and surviving, and not just surviving, but damn near winning the fight, and then having a great showing against Canelo in that win, I think he he's pretty much like, there's nobody else that scares me. Let's run this back. And if I can beat him, I am the king for the next five to six years. He's only 33, I think. So, yeah, that's the way I see it. Let me know what you guys think about that. Uh, let me go ahead and get, get ready to chop this up and splice this up because I want to go, go ahead and um, talk about uh, Tim Zoo in my next video. Um, but before I make the video, I'll end it off with this. Let me know in the comments below. Um, what do you think is next for Tim Zhu? Do you think this is the end? Do you think that he's going to be able to bounce back? If he does bounce back, will he bounce back to 100%, 50%, 80%, 20%? What say you? Leave it in the comments below, and I'll catch you on the next one.
Deuces. Thank you.